Welcome to the third science and conservation event of our 2023-24 program um, from ZSL. And thanks for joining us today, where we celebrate 10 years of Garden Wildlife Help, a citizen science project. Um, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Katta, and I'm a wildlife veterinarian, originally from Austria, and moved to the UK in 2012 to do my PhD, and I'm working with ZSL on the Garden Wildlife Health project since 2016, and I will lead you to through this evening today and tell you a little bit about the Garden Wildlife Health Project. Okay, I hope you can all see that. So we are celebrating 10 years of Garden Wildlife Health today, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and why we do it, and how it all works, and then give you some brief examples of some disease investigations that we conducted. So whilst I'm presenting about this project today, there are of course more people involved in Garden Wildlife Health. So I wanted to give you a brief introduction to them. Um, we are a small but a dedicated team consisting of um, Andrew and Becky here at the top left, who are wildlife vets and are overseeing the project. And then we have Shinto, our microbiologist. And in the bottom row, you can see myself and Sarah, who are the wildlife vets working on the more day-to-day -day aspects of the project together with Emily, who is our project technician. So what is Garden Wildlife Health? So we're a collaborative wildlife disease surveillance project and we're based at Sadazel London Zoo, but we're working in close partnership with the British Trust for Ornithology, so the BTO, the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and Frog Life, um, which also more or less reflects the species we focus on namely garden birds, amphibians, reptiles, and also hedgehogs. So the fundamental aim of our project is to monitor the health of British garden wildlife and to identify any potential disease threats. But there are of course um, many other and more aspects to it. For example, once we do identify a disease threat to British wildlife, we're also actively involved in trying to find um, and also promote ways of mitigating that threat where it might be appropriate. Um, and this of course can vary in its scale from providing individual members of the public with advice on what they could do in their garden to reduce disease spread, um, up to developing national mitigation strategies um, and to inform NGOs and government decision-making. So we do all of this with a view of One Health, with a One Health approach. So the idea is to conserve biodiversity, but also to safeguard public health as well as companion animal and livestock health. And of course, we also want to protect and ensure wild animal welfare. So we do our uh, disease surveillance through citizen science. So what is citizen science? So that is scientific work like data collection, for example, that is undertaken by the public, by anybody who wants to participate. And that's often in collaboration with, or even under supervision of scientists or scientific institutions. So wildlife disease surveillance schemes, they have the goal to detect a range of disease threats and they're typically reported at. So they rely on reports of sickness or death in wildlife. And citizen science, that offers a really powerful to tool to achieve this. Um, because it allows us to collect large scale data over like long periods of time and, and huge spatial distances. Um, and especially when we're thinking about private gardens where we as scientists would never be able to monitor what's going on without the help of the public, because we obviously can't be in there ourselves. And for the participants themselves, this can be a great way of learning new things and engaging with nature and promoting general well being. So although the current form of Garden Wildlife Health is celebrating 10 years, um, ZSL's history of performing wildlife disease surveillance actually spans over three decades. So starting as a response to amphibian and avian mortality events um, that led to the um, incursion of the Frog Mortality Project and the Wild Bird Mortality Project back in 1992. And that then um, led to the establishment of the Garden Bird Health Initiative in 2005-2006 in response to numerous disease outbreaks in garden birds, to then the Garden Wildlife Health Project in 2013 in its current form with reptiles and hedgehogs being added to the list of species that we were investigating. So here is a schematic outline of how our project actually works. So we, re we receive disease incident reports in two ways. 
So through so-called opportunistic reports, meaning ad hoc reports directly via our website, a website which you can see here, um, where you can report any sightings of ill health in garden wildlife as and when you encounter them. And the second way is via the BTO Garden Bird Watch, which we will hear more about from Mike later. But briefly, this is also a citizen science scheme where participants report on a weekly basis about the wildlife species they see in their gardens and providing therefore important species abundance data. And in addition, they also provide information on any presence or perceived absence of any signs of ill health, which is a crucial piece of information as it basically also acts as a control data. And whenever there is a freshly dead carcass involved in an incident, there might be an opportunity for us to investigate this further by conducting a post-mortem examination, since um, whilst reports alone provide us with uh, lots of really useful information, we can of course only reach a definite diagnosis and really know what's going on when we conduct an examination. So we then link our findings, as mentioned before, to species abundance data, which then enables us to evaluate whether a disease may have a population impact. And the ultimate goal is then to provide evidence-based advice and practical guidance on methods um, and strategies for disease prevention and control. So over the past decade, we have received over 36 thousand disease incident reports, and the vast majority of those involve observations of sick or dead garden birds, which is then followed by similar numbers of hedgehog and amphibians, and a very small number of reptile reports, which are really our underrepresented species group here. So where possible, we conduct post-mortem examinations supported by a wide range of lab tests according to the species that we investigate or as indicated by any specific findings. And we have to date examined over 30,000, 3,000 carcasses since 2013. And um, the overall aim of these examinations is of course to determine the course of death of the animal, but also to, to identify any potential underlying conditions um, that might have been affecting the animal but might have not directly contributed to its death. We also want to gather general data and general morphometrics uh, and find out what is normal in these uh, still understudied species. So during these examinations, we also collect a variety of tissues for our archives, which now contains tens of thousands of samples, which allows us, for example, to track diseases in space and time and to get an understanding of their emergence. So all this together helps us to study disease and their impacts and to provide evidence-based advice on mitigation. And to make this information as accessible as possible, we translate our findings um, into a variety of formats. So here are some examples. So we provide various resources directly on our website where you can find, for example, a list of all our publications um, and also our interactive mapping function where you can have a look into the spatial distribution of certain species or disease conditions um, that are reported to us. We also provide a library of over 30 disease fact sheets containing information on common disease conditions um, and what we could do um, in case of a disease outbreak. Um, together with other health surveillance projects here at ZSL, we are also part of the Great Britain Wildlife Health Partnership and contribute to quarterly government reports, which are also accessible online. Um, and of course, we also aim to share findings and advice on social media. And here you can see our handles in case you want to follow. We also try to provide lots of best practice advice and guidelines on our website. So for example, on how to safely dispose of wildlife carcasses should you encounter some, um, or the do's and don'ts of garden bird feeding. Um, and with every report or submission that we get, we always aim to respond personally with an email and share our thoughts and findings. Uh, and all these resources that we have available on our website are very useful tools to provide more detailed information. So especially as a citizen science project, um, visibility is key. So where possible, we also try to participate in events or collaborate on articles or press releases, contribute to wildlife podcasts, online events like today, um, art projects on our website. Um, and we have, for example, um, on our website, a video animation on ranavirus infections in frogs, which was narrated by Stephen Fry. 
So as you see, there are lots of different aspects uh, involved in Garden Wildlife Health. Uh, and following this very brief whistle stop of overview about how the project works, um, I wanted to give you um, a, sort of a feel for some of the um, diseases that we investigated. So first, our probably most discussed uh, condition in garden birds, and which you might have heard of, um, finch trichomonosis. So finch trichomonosis is a parasitic disease caused by a protozoan and microscopically small parasite called Trichomonas gallina, and we will hear more about this disease um, in the coming talks. So this disease is predominantly affecting green finches and to a slightly lesser extent chuff finches, but has been diagnosed in most finch species and also many other garden birds. So this infectious disease uh, can cause severe lesions in the esophagus, so the gullet of the affected bird, as you can see in the middle picture here, um, which leads to obstruction of the gullet and basically preventing the affected bird of being able to swallow. So the birds will then typically appear fluffed up and lethargic, which are just general signs of a bird being unwell. And they're then uh, often observed trying to, but uh, so trying to, but failing to feed, um, and therefore often have food stuck to the beak. So we can see here on the left image what that could look like. So because they can't swallow, they will drop the seed again, which is now covered in saliva containing this parasite. And that offers an easy way for the next bird to get infected when it comes to pick that um, contaminated seed up. So the disease gets easily transmitted via contaminated food or, for example, when birds feed each other during the breeding season or when parents feed their young. So this was first identified in British finches in 2006, and it raised a lot of public concern, um, given the large number of sudden deaths in green finches and also chuff finches. Um, and this had a dramatic impact on green finches in, in this country. So far, it is suggested that we have lost up to 70% of our breeding population in British green finches, and we're getting close to 40% of, of chuff finches, which is an incredible impact on a population level. Um, and this disease has led to the green finches jumping from being green listed directly to being red listed in the birds of conservation concern, meaning they're now considered at risk of extinction. Um, and this is also the first time a wild bird species got red listed due to the uh, impact of an infectious disease. So we also need to keep this disease in mind as a potential threat to other already vulnerable species. Um, like red poles, yellow hammers, or whole finches, which are also susceptible to this disease. So we are therefore currently focusing on gaining a better understanding of how supplementary feeding can influence disease transmission and about uh, the measures we can take to help reduce these risks. And we will hear more about trichomonosis and these recent projects to further investigate this in the talks um, that are upcoming from Will and Mike. So moving from birds to hedgehogs, a species that is sadly also struggling, um, but we don't know exactly the specific reasons. So as you can see here, over the past decades, there's an observed decline in UK's hedgehog populations of an estimated um, 25 to about 70, uh, 75%. And in Great Britain, hedgehogs have now been also listed as vulnerable to extinction. So our current understanding is that this decline is likely due to a number of factors like habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, um, road traffic accidents, potentially loss of prey. But the relative importance of these factors is still uncertain. And um, within Garden Wildlife Health, we are trying to learn more on um, how diseases might affect hedgehogs and whether diseases could play a role um, contributing to this observed decline. So whilst we do diagnose a range of infectious diseases in hedgehogs, we have to date not identified one specific condition that might be affecting them on a population level. We are, however, also interested in non-infectious conditions um, like trauma or predation, which we also really commonly find in these animals. Um, and we are currently particularly interested in the effects that um, any pollutant exposure or intoxications might have on the population. So by using our frozen tissue archives, we are currently investigating the hedgehog's exposure to pesticides and rodenticides in England in a collaboration with FERA. Um, and we're trying to gain an understanding of how these chemicals might affect hedgehog health on an individual or even a population level. 
So when we're thinking about reports we receive about ill health in our hepatofauna, so meaning amphibians and reptiles, we receive many more reports of amphibians compared to reptiles, which of course is not helped by their cryptic and secretive nature. And then Andrew will elaborate further in this uh, on his, in his talk. But I wanted to give you an example of how much we can learn even from this modest number of reports and submissions we receive and showing you how important every single one of these reports um, is. So a key finding in reptile health and our main research focus in snakes is a snake fungal disease. So that's a fungal skin infection known as ophidiomycosis. This disease was first documented in North America, um, where it was found to lead to skin lesions and skin thickening, and also abnormal skin sheddening and crusting. And we identified this condition for the first time in the UK in wild grass snakes in 2015. And we then also had a PhD student working with us who investigated the occurrence of this SFD in an English grass snake population and to investigate its impact on snake health. And he's now working hard to publish his findings. So there will hopefully be more to share on this in the near future. So through our samples uh, and reports that we get, um, we also contributed to other studies, for example, investigating how this disease condition might have spread. And it was found that the movement of captive snakes between continents may have been involved, which highlights again, the importance of carefully considering biosecurity measures um, in this case, actually, specifically for people who uh, keep captive reptiles. So as you can see, even though we only investigate a handful of cases a year, there is much more information to gain from those. So please help us to learn more about reptiles by reporting any sightings of ill health to our website. So we have collaborated and worked with many great organizations and institutions over the past decade, and here's a list of some of them. So this is just to highlight the importance of working together and sharing resource, resources. So it's really especially great to have all our partner organizations contribute to this little celebration event today, which again highlights how we all work together to safeguard British wildlife. And of course, none of this would have been possible over the last 10 years without the ongoing support of our funders and all of you out there who report to us and provide us with samples. So many, many thanks for this. Um, and in case this is useful, here are again um, our links. And now we'll um, stop sharing my screen and slowly hand over to Will. Um, Here we go. Okay, so any questions, do pop them in the Q&A slot. Um, any questions on my talk, we'll pick up in the discussion and I'll hand over to Will Peach. So um, Will Peach is the head of conservation uh, science for England and Wales at the RSPB, where he leads a team of ecologists working on a variety of applied conservation problems, including studies on declining species, trial conservation management and development of sustainable farming practices. He's currently leading, as mentioned before, a collaborative research project between the RSPB, the BTO, and us here at the Institute of Zoology, which aims to improve our understanding of finch trichomonosis with the ultimate aim of developing mitigate, mitigation measures. Um, so again, thanks for joining us this evening, Will, and I'm handing over to you. Thanks very much, Kata. I just received a very strange message from Zoom telling me it's about to uh, log me out. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. I'm Will Peach, uh, work in the RSPB science team. And my talk tonight is really about um, to talk to you about some of the ways in which RSPB and its partners is responding to this growing threat uh, of disease to, to wild birds. Uh, so RSPB has been a proud um, supporting partner of Garden Wildlife Health for more than 20 years now. And one of our, our strongest links between the two organisations is through the RSPB's Wildlife Inquiries Unit. So this is the part of the RSPB um, that members of the public will come to if they've got queries or concerns about wildlife. Um, and in a typical year, that unit will receive about 30,000 inquiries. And of those, typically about six to 700 um, relate to wildlife disease. Now, now each of those individual um, inquiries will receive a personal response, an individual response. 
Um, but but as well as, as that, um, RSPB provides more generic advice on disease management. So, for example, we we publish um, leaflets giving advice on garden bird diseases, for example. Our website um, provides advice on, on managing and mitigating disease. And our magazine often has features and Q&As on, on disease too. Um, where, where we do receive reports that, that sound like they might involve wildlife disease, we will refer those on to Garden Wildlife Health by encouraging reporters to do so. And what, it's interesting, when you look back at the data um, over, over several decades, um, this, the, the frequency of such reports can actually be useful for disease surveillance. Okay, so this, this graph um, summarizes the numbers of, the rep of reports of dead birds coming into the um, Wildlife Inquiries Unit at the RSPB. And on the left side of this, this graph, we start off in 2001, um, the, the, hatch, the, the shading of the different vertical bars gives you the, the breakdown of the numbers dying in each season. So in 2001, you can see the, the largest bar is, is the cross-hatched uh, bar, and that is winter um, reports of dead birds. And those were post-mortem examinations um, by the Garden Wildlife Health team showed that most of those were related to salmonella outbreaks in finches and sparrows. But what's interesting about these data is that as you move from 2001 through to 2006, the seasonal pattern of mortality changes completely. We've now got an autumn peak shown by the black bar, the black vertical bars. And again, post-mortem showed that, that um, the, the, the cause of that mortality was now trichomonas coming through. As uh, Kat has already mentioned, um, trichomonas is a, a protozoan parasite. Um, that causes problems for the birds through lesions in their throat, stopping them, very often stopping them feeding and, um, and drinking. Um, subsequent detective work by um, the IOZ and BTO identified a, a new and, and very often lethal strain um, of trike that appeared to have emerged around that time. Can we have the next slide? So, um, and in those early days, greenfinch was, was one of the main sufferers of um, this, this new lethal strain of trike. And uh, the, the top left graph here shows the, the UK population trend for greenfinch. And around about 2006, seven, the birds were doing fine, but then shortly afterwards, they went into a very rapid decline, eventually losing two thirds of the population across the UK. Um, Chaffinch, interestingly, had, 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 has had a, suffered a later decline, about eight, eight years later than the greenfinch. But you can see now that that has also experienced a rapid and ongoing decline. And again, great detective work by the BTO and the IOZ have, have again linked that decline very much to this new lethal form of trike. Uh, I think Mike Toms might, might tell us a bit more about the, that detective work in a following talk. But it's not just back garden finches that are affected by this 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 new form of trike. It's 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 some of our rarer um, red list conservation concern species. So hawfinch, for example, is a range restricted um, and very shy finch that lives lives in in pockets around the UK. And and for this species, we've seen multiple outbreaks um, of the same strain of, of trichomonas. Uh, for example, in the mid Wales population since two thousand and fifteen involving multiple sick, but sick birds and, and positive post-mortem exams. And for the turtle dove, um, which is a sort of farmland bird really, screening of live birds in East Anglia um, has shown very high rates of infection with trichomonas. 95% of individual turtle doves will, will carry the, the trike parasite. And um, where the where the new clonal strain, this lethal strain, is involved, a high proportion of those birds will show clinical signs of, of sickness or death. So the, the point of this slide is, is that the effects of, the, of this new lethal strain of trike are, 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 are being seen way beyond gardens and, and way beyond garden finches. Next slide, please. So concern about um, finch trichomonosis has led to a new study that, that's, that's just started last year 
And this is a collaboration between RSPB, BTO and ZSL. And there are three elements to this new study, all, all, all of which are focused on better understanding trike, trike in finches. The first part of the study is analysing ex existing garden birdwatch data from the BTO and really trying to identify any predictors of these um, sickness outbreaks in residential gardens. So the sorts of information we can screen here is the, the abundance of finches themselves in the, the, in the gardens concerned, the abundance of potential carrier species like pigeons and doves, and then other variables like the season, the weather, the landscape, and, and, and interestingly, the, the intensity of supplementary feeding in that garden. So do any of these, these variables out there in the environment, are any of those a particular high risk in leading to subsequent disease outbreaks? But that work is undergoing and we hope to see some results from that um, very soon. The second element of the research is, is looking at the, the risk of disease spread from conservation projects that may involve supplementary feeding. So many sort of species focused um, conservation projects these days will involve a supplementary feeding aspect. So for example, the, the twite here, so shown bottom right, is a, a, an, an upland uh, finch that is very, very range restricted now, at least in England, and it has a bit of a foothold still in the South Pennines. And this species there is a subject of a, a quite intensive conservation action involving habitat management, um, supplementary feeding, and nest site protection. And, and what, this, what this new project is doing is reviewing the likely pros and cons of the supplementary feeding for the target species, um, including the risks of disease transmission, and the awareness of the disease amongst the project managers and whether or not there's adequate mitigation. So you can imagine for a, for a twite feed it, feed, you know, taking the supplementary seed that's put out on these bricks up in the Pennines, you know, it's quite possible that they might come into contact with, with infected green finches or perhaps doves, for example. Can we go to the next slide, please. And the third element of this study is, is to really to try and understand the main transmission routes of trike uh, in residential settings. And there are two elements to this. First of all, we'll be collecting really quite detailed bird behavior data at shared communal resources, things like feeders and water baths. And we'll be recording the, the incidence of behaviors that might, might risk direct transmission of the parasite. So things like bill to bill contact between individual birds or social feeding, that will be a parent feeding a youngster, for example. And we'll be comparing that to the incidence of behaviours that might risk indirect transmission um, of, of the parasite. And, and that might include, for example, a sick bird unable to swallow the, the, a, a food, a, a seed item, for example, and then dropping, dropping that food in, in a location where other birds might pick it up and therefore transmit the disease. So that's the behavioural side. And we'll collect that data using these um, digital camcorders shown on the left. And the other aspect of this study is that we'll be screening feeders, spilt food resources, water resources for live viable trike organism. So we'll be trying to understand the sorts of situations in back gardens that are harboring this parasite. Next slide, please. So if you compare these feeding and watering situations, what, what we hope the study will tell us is, is what sorts of situations are gonna be high risk for maintaining viable trike. If you look, for example, at the water bath there, clearly multiple birds of multiple species will come in and, 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 and use that water, water uh, resource. And we know that trike can survive for, for some time in, in water. Um, perhaps some of these other feeding situations will turn out to be lower risk. We'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Next slide, please. OK, I want to change tack here now and just step outside of gardens, if I may. So a, a, a major challenge for RSPB and, and many other agencies, including government, has been the emergence of highly pathogenic avian influenza, particularly in the last few years in the UK. And I'm sure many of you will have seen horrendous stories of this on the news and the media. So the, the most recent sort of bout of, of AI really came to prominence in the summer of 21. And uh, RSPB and others noticed that great skewers in particular were being affected in northern Scotland with hundreds of dead birds being reported. That following winter, um, wildfowl were particularly affected with thousands of barnacle geese, for example, being found dead on the Solway estuary in northern England. Subsequently, the, the virus spread south across Great Britain 
and 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 was infecting a wider range of species so particularly seabirds including terns but also raptors and um, gulls were increasingly affected next slide please so what's rspb been doing about this well we first of all we've been trying to understand the impacts so we've been involved in disease testing um, organizing samples um, collection and transport to labs and so on We've been monitoring mortality and um, direct mortality on both on our nature reserves and, and, and elsewhere. Last summer, we conducted, we with, with others conducted a large number of repeat seabird surveys at some of the worst affected colonies around the UK. And the map on the right hand side shows the locations of some of those surveys. And we're trying to understand there the, the effects of the AI mortality in relation to um, a, a full census that was conducted um, in the years preceding 2022. So we've got the baseline and then the post AI situation. We've also been collating global case studies on, on the population level effects of HPAI on wild birds. And we, we hope this will give us some sort of prediction of, of how some of the more recent outbreaks um, might be affecting bird populations and, and whether those impacts are perhaps short lived blips or perhaps lead to longer term population declines. And finally, we've been involved in quite a few studies looking at the development of natural immunity um, to avian flu. And um, in fact, just this week, there's a very encouraging study just, just published, which has shown that um, returning barnacle geese to the Solway estuary in Northern England, three quarters of those birds in the winter following that major outbreak are actually apparently healthy and carrying antibodies to the virus which it provides some real hope, I think, that, that, that natural immunity may spread quickly amongst wild birds. In terms of mitigation, we're, of, we're clearly mindful and interested in potential mitigation. And we've been involved in some carcass removal studies, some experimental approaches. And for, and for some species, at least, the, these seem to be helpful in reducing uh, infection rates, with sandwich term showing very, very promising results from, from Northwest Europe uh, currently. And in some restricted situations, vaccines may even have a, a role to play. So particularly where long lived birds are being reintroduced into the environment, you know, it, it, th th there may be benefits in seeking to vaccinate those individuals. And experience currently with the California condor um, is, is suggesting some real, real benefits uh, along those lines. Clearly, vaccines are not going to be appropriate for, for most uh, wild, wild, wild bird populations. Next slide, please. And just fin finally, on, on AI, a bit of a curiosity. So as many of you will know, gannets, these large and remarkable seabirds, have, um, have lovely light blue irises normally. And you can see that in the photograph on the top right. Um, but at Bass Rock in 2022, um, some RSPB researchers up there noticed for the first time that they started seeing gannets with, where the irises were completely black. And there is a photograph of such, such a gannet on the bottom right. And when, when a sample of those two categories of birds, was a, a blood sample was taken, it, it was striking that nearly all of the birds with black irises um, had antibodies to H5N1, the, the uh, AI agent. And nearly all of the birds with, with the, blue, the, the normal blue irises um, lacked any antibodies. So it looks like iris color in the gannet is a phenotypic indicator of recent infection. And, and, and apart from being a, a strange and curious observation, that may, may well actually be a useful tool in the researchers, um, in the researchers toolkit going, going ahead, going forward, uh, you know, as a measure of, of previous infection for individual birds. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to sort of sum up, I think it's very true to say that infectious disease is now posing, posing an increased um, threat to wild birds in, in the UK and beyond. Potential drivers of, of this increasing threat, I think, include climate change, as diseases spread north, for example, intensive livestock production, where some of these diseases can move between um, captive and, and wild populations. And, and I think we also have to acknowledge supplementary feeding, including sometimes in residential gardens, may be promoting um, the transmission of diseases. Disease surveillance programs like the Garden Wildlife Health are really important. But I think the power of those data really comes through when they're combined with avian abundance and de demography data as collected by organizations like the BTO. 
Managing the impacts of disease is, is going to be challenging, but not impossible, as, as we've seen with some of these encouraging results for carcass removal and avian flu. And um, what is going to be key, I think, going, going forward and address, addressing some of these challenges is that we need more funding to, to cover the surveillance research and mitigation uh, work. Next slide, please. And with a view on, on funding, the RSPV has recently launched a, a new funding appeal. Um, it, it's called the Wildlife Diseases Fund. And we're hoping that if this appeal is successful in generating significant funds, this can really um, help us move forward in both in understanding the impacts of these emerging wildlife diseases, but also in developing management and mitigation measures. Thanks very much. That's the final slide. Thank you very much, Will. That was great. Um, great way of highlighting the power of collaboration, working together, and how we really try to get a better understanding of how disease affects our wildlife and also the challenges we face with things like avian influenza. Um, great. Um, I think we have no specific question popping up for that talk, so more general ones that we will keep for the panel discussion at the end. So we will go directly on to our next speaker, who is um, Mike Toms, Head of Communications at the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, and he's responsible for communicating results um, of the BTO scientific work to a broad range, broad range of audiences. Um, and he has overseen the BTO's garden ecology team for over a decade. And he's also an author of a number of books on garden and other birds. So he's hugely involved in improving our understanding of how and why birds use gardens and the resources that they provide to us. So thanks, Mike, for joining us today. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. So just to check that everyone can see my title slide. OK, perfect. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So, yes, I'm Mike Toms. I'm head of comms at BTO and I've worked on garden ecology for a number of years. And what I want to do um, through this talk is give you a bit of um, insight into how data from different surveys and projects can be brought together to really help us understand uh, what is happening around disease in terms of bird populations, to really kind of understand, particularly in the case of garden birds, how evidence of disease then feeds through to population change where that occurs. So hopefully, yeah. So BTO is a, an organisation that has been monitoring bird populations uh, since the 1930s. And we're really a partnership between our scientists based uh, predominantly at Thetford in Norfolk, but we also have offices in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and our volunteers. And we've got something like 60,000 people uh, that are involved with BTO and our work, and they participate in a range of different surveys and schemes. And the information that they collect tells us different things. So we have information, for example, on species like grey heron. And what we have is a measure of uh, grey heron population abundance going back to the 1930s. And you can see from this slide that over that uh, very long time period, there are some peaks and troughs uh, within the population as the population has changed. And some of those, particularly the troughs, relate to um, periods of severe winter weather, which we know can impact heron populations. But you'll notice more recently, um, there's a bit of a downward trend. So we have information on the changing abundance of species through time. And that information is then used um, by others, like RSPB and other NGOs, it's used by government, it feeds into uh, some of the biodiversity indicators, and it enables people to assess policies, to direct resources towards conservation efforts, and to really understand what is happening to our bird populations over time. We also carry out periodic um, atlas surveys where we look at the distribution of species across Britain and Ireland. Uh, we've done three breeding atlases and two winter atlases. And these are really important because they tell us about distribution and they tell us about distribution change. So in a species like buzzard, we can see the recovery of the buzzard population between 1968, 72 atlas, and the most recent atlas, uh, 2007 to 2011. And you can see how this species has recolonized um, from the north and the west right across uh, England, 
and you can see the increase in the population and the range within Ireland. So both the abundance data that come from annual surveys and the periodic atlas surveys tell us about change in numbers and distribution. But importantly, if we want to understand what is driving those changes, then we need to look at the kind of the demographics. What are the processes behind this? And essentially, there are four things that determine whether a bird population goes up or goes down. So the number of um, young birds recruited into the population will determine to an extent whether it goes up, it can increase the population. And the level of mortality that's affecting the population can determine whether it goes down. And then the other two factors are immigration and emigration. So we can collect information on these different components. So bird ringing, where we fit small, uniquely numbered rings to birds, can tell us not just where birds go, but it also tells us um, about survival and how survival changes over time. And we have a number of ringing surveys which have a very systematic structure, and they can also tell us a little bit about productivity. But the information that we get on productivity primarily comes from our nest record scheme. And we have uh, nest recorders who go out um, and record what happens to individual nesting attempts. So they monitor these and they look at whether they're successful or unsuccessful. They record things like clutch size, uh, brood size, the state the nest is at. And if it is unsuccessful, um, some indication of why. So it could be evidence of predation, it could be evidence that the nest has been trampled by livestock or something else. And importantly, those data um, give us really, really valuable insight into productivity. So we can take all of that and build it into models that tell us, help us understand why a population changes. Now I'm going to focus on gardens and the information that we get from gardens comes primarily from our weekly garden bird watch. So we've got just over 20,000 people that participate and each week they tell us about the birds they see in their gardens. They also collect information on other wildlife, so bees, mammals, reptiles and amphibians. Importantly, not only do they tell us about the birds using their gardens, they also collect information um, on disease. And I want to pick up the story that both Katha and uh, Will have touched on around trichomonosis in finches, because this is a really good example of being able to bring those different BTO data sets together to unravel the, what is happening to the populations of these birds. So Garden Bird Watch, as I mentioned, um, has been collecting information, but we also have information from um, our other surveys on um, these species. And in this case, this is a graph um, that we saw earlier. So this is greenfinch abundance. And these graphs, um, what they don't show the absolute number um, of greenfinches, they have a measure, an index. So the survey data enable us to look at change from one year to the next, because the survey methods are consistent from one year to the next. And with these statistical models and these approaches, what we do is we set the index to 100. So that dotted horizontal line towards the bottom of the graph, that is the index. And so that is the year that we're setting the index to. So 100. And typically with this statistic, you either set it to the second point in the series or second to last point in the series. So every other dot is relative to that dot. So if you have an index of 100 in one year and 10 years later, you have an index of 120, that means for every 100 greenfinches you saw in the first year, you now see 120. And what these data from the wider countryside show in the case of greenfinch is a population that was increasing uh, from the mid 1980s, um, reaching a peak around the mid 2000s and then suddenly dropping away. Now, if we look in gardens, we can use a GBW data. And Garden Bird Watch started in 1995. And with Garden Bird Watch, what we have are weekly records. So it looks a little bit different. We don't have dots, we have a continuous line. And this continuous line shows you peaks and troughs that reflect the annual change in garden use. So the measure up the left hand side is what we call our reporting rate, and it's a percentage. And effectively, what it shows is the proportion of gardens 
or the percentage of gardens that reported greenfinch in that week. And so you can see typically from when Garden Bird Watch started in the mid 1990s through to about 2005, it was typically around about 70 percent. But there was this seasonal pattern that kind of dropped down to 60 percent and went up to about 80 percent. And then suddenly in 2005 to six and six to seven, it drops away. And one of the great things about Garden Bird Watch is because it's weekly and the data come in through the Internet, we can very quickly see if something different is happening. With the wider countryside data, which comes from a survey that takes place in sort of May, June each year, it's many months before we actually get to see that signal. So GBW is very good at kind of finger on the pulse. So in the case of Greenfinch, we had this information, this signal coming in from Garden Bird Watch that something was happening. The reporting rate was dropping. The average number counted in gardens was dropping. Alongside that reporting, our participants were also um, contributing to Garden Wildlife Health's predecessor, the Garden Bird Health Initiative, and recording information on signs of disease in gardens. And on our online system, we have um, tabs for recording birds and other wildlife. We also have a tab for recording disease. And people can tell us if they've seen a sick or diseased bird, amphibian, reptile, mammal, and they can give us an indication of the type of um, disease signs that they are seeing. So that's really, really useful background information. It gives us a systematic overview of disease incidents in gardens. And that's really important. So we were able to leverage this information alongside other data from BTO to actually look at the pattern of the disease emergence in greenfinches. And this is um, a plot that shows two different things. On the left hand side is a map showing the number of incidents, um, the number of reports of disease in greenfinches that had been um, submitted opportunistically to the Garden Bird Health Initiative. And one of the challenges with opportunistic data is you can get a press story in one part of the country where it talks about we're suddenly seeing lots of diseased birds and that can trigger people to get in touch. And if you don't have a press story somewhere else in the country, then you might not get the reports, even though you're seeing diseased birds. On the right hand side, we have a similar plot, um, this time using the systematic information from Garden Bird Watch. So on that uh, map, there are lots of little yellow dots, and those are Garden Bird Watch gardens um, at which there was no um, report of disease. So people had said, I have not seen any disease. And the red dots were sites where people had reported disease. And what we we're able to do is use that information to calculate three different areas, three different regions. One of high disease incidents, and that was kind of in the Welsh borders uh, and the West Midlands. One intermediate, which was kind of around the East Midlands, and pushing down into central southern England, and a low region in the far east and southeast of England. And once we had defined those regions, we could then use other information. So garden bird watch information, breeding bird survey information to look at what was happening to the populations of greenfinches, chaffinches and dunnock. And the reason for doing that was that we were seeing disease in greenfinches. We were seeing disease in chaffinches, but we weren't seeing it in dunnocks. So dunnock was something of a control. And what we did was look to see what was happening to the populations of those three species in those three regions. And what the data revealed to us was that in the high incidence region, the greenfinch population dropped by 35% between 2006, 2007, and the chaffinch population dropped by 21%. But in the medium, medium regions and in the low incidence region, those figures were far lower. So actually in the low incidence region, it was a 10% decline for greenfinch and no decline for chaffinch. And Dunnock didn't show a decline at all. It actually showed an 11% increase in the high incidence region. 
So that points quite a strong finger at disease as driving those population changes. Will touched on um, the difference in the um, pattern of population change between greenfinch and chaffinch. And that work that I've just touched on uh, was followed up more recently, again using BTO data and led by BTO staff, looking at greenfinch again, but looking at chaffinch in more detail. And I wanted to use that an example as an example of how we can bring together the different information. So we have the post-mortem examinations carried out through Garden Wildlife Health and the Garden Bird Health Initiative. And we can look for patterns within those. When do we start seeing an increase in reported cases of trichomonosis, um, you know, and, and pulling together that part of the story? Because we can use those to identify change points when the disease emerge, when it, you know, and the differences between uh, greenfinch and chaffinch. But alongside that, we can use the data that I mentioned right at the start of the talk, information from bird ringing, and we call those ring recoveries. So that's recoveries of ring birds, information from the nest record scheme to tell us about productivity and information on the changing populations from the breeding bird survey. And what we can then do is a little bit of detective work to see which of those um, components Ringing tells us about survival, the nest records telling about us about productivity, which of those components matches what's happening with the disease and matches what's happening as a driver with the population. And we pull these together in a statistical model. We call this integrated population modeling. So what we do have, let me just see if I can get the laser pointer. We can do survival analyses using the ring recovery data. We can look at nest survival and productivity and we can look at population change. We bring them all together and then we put these through what we call life table response experiments. And that tells us what the underlying drivers of population change are. And I, one other thing we can do is we can actually look at how maybe the survival differs by habitat. So if we think that um, the disease is being passed between birds at garden feeding stations, um, rather than say in woodland, we can we would expect to see the survival impact if it's important being more obvious within the built environment than it is, say, in the wider countryside. And when we pull all this together, we get um, something like this out. And this is this graph. All it really shows is which of these things are contributing to the decline that we have seen. And that the strength of that is um, measured by the percentage contribution. So you can see that for both chaffinch and greenfinch, adult survival is behind that population decline. And that links directly when we look at timing to the disease. So we can be really certain that finch trichomonosis has caused that 68% decline um, in greenfinches that we've seen and that 26% decline in chaffinches. Importantly, the work also revealed um, a link with garden feeding stations in the sense that survival appeared to be more important in areas uh, associated with human habitation. So that's, um, that's really important because that means that we then need to provide more advice uh, and support to people feeding garden birds and really alert them to the risks from poor hygiene practices. So an important role that BTO plays isn't just collecting the evidence um, about why these populations are changing. It's also about giving people advice off the back of that evidence and sharing that evidence with other organisations so they can do the same. There are other things that we can do um, looking to the future. So bird ringers are in a very fortunate position in that they actually handle birds. They're fitting these tiny little rings to birds, but it does give them the opportunity to collect samples. So they could swab birds, for example, and it's something that they do in the Netherlands to actually collect samples that can then be tested for disease. So we can actually get early warning of new diseases potentially emerging within the UK, and we can get a measure of the background levels of disease in different species. 
I mentioned that Garden Birdwatch also covers other taxa and collects disease information on other taxa. So actually we're well placed to um, not only produce um, information on the trends in abundance um, or occurrence of mammal and other species in the built environment, but to actually use that and leverage that when trying to understand the disease ecology um, that relates to these species. I wanted to just touch on one final thing. And this is um, a new and emerging disease within the UK, and it's a thing called Usutu. And what we're able to do with our data sets is actually divide up um, those data sets to look at different regions to understand what's going on. And from the breeding bird survey, we can see that in Blackbird, the uh, trend for London, which is this blue line here, shows a different trajectory. It's lower than it is for many of the other regions, but it's highly urbanised, so that's not a uh, surprise. But this sudden drop off more recently. And that ties in through some work that we've done in partnership with ZSL and others, um, ties in with an emergence of Yusutu virus in London. And Garden Birdwatch, again, is well placed to look at this because we have the weekly reporting. And here, this graph shows a number of regions, and you can see pretty consistent pattern. This is London, and you can see there is this sudden change through sort of 2020, where that typical pattern for London suddenly drops away. So because of the number of people that are involved in the project, and because of its weekly nature, we can very quickly um, identify if something appears to be going on. And that can then help us and our partners um, target work to really understand, OK, what is that? What is that a signal of? Is it disease? Is it something else? And I think that's one of the real powers of citizen science in a project like this. You know, Garden Birdwatch is just people at home looking out their kitchen window or their lounge window, recording what they see. But because they do it in a systematic way, because they do it week after week, we can build up this really fascinating picture of what's going on. And then we can leverage the other data sets that we hold from things like the Breeding Bird Survey and other projects such as Ringing and Nest Records to understand why, what is driving these changes. And then we can provide the evidence to inform a response. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. That was fascinating. A great way of showing um, how we all work together and how the power of citizen science, as you said. Um, we'll keep any questions for the discussion because um, we are running a shorter and shorter of time. So I will um, also, I can see lots of questions already being answered, but there are some that we can still all together discuss. Um, so we will go on to our next and final speaker of today, who is um, Andrew Smart, who is joining us from Frog Life. Um, so Andrew um, joined Frog Life after 25 years of teaching conservation and running higher education and further education university centers. He has worked um, on many interesting things like Mediterranean loggerheads and green turtles, common toads on the Avon levels, fresh in freshwater lakes in Kenya, he was part of the formative research group at the Darrell Institute for Conservation and Ecology. Um, and more recently, he worked with the University of Cardiff and Cornwall College of uh, Newquay on uh, surveying frogs and toads in the Borneo rainforest. So he's now based in Cornwall um, and he's involved in projects on palmet newts and invasive species, as well as lizard surveys on the coast. So, Andrew, great to have you here and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. I'll just um, hang on. I'll just set up my screen. Perfect. Thank you. Is that sorry? Is that working? Yes, working fine. Thank you. Okay, right. That's great. Fine. Um, so yeah, my name is Andrew Smart. I'm the conservation and science manager at Frog Life. And I'm here to talk about how Frog Life engages with the Garden Wildlife Health Project. Um, the here we go. Right, did that change? Sorry. Yeah. So the the outline of of the presentation. I'm going to introduce Frog Life, our strategy, and, and how we link up with Garden Wildlife Health. Talk a little bit about the history of our involvement with the project. 
and then take you through how we respond to reports of disease and mortality in amphibians and reptiles, what actually happens when we get a report. And then finally, take you through some of the frog life inquiry data and national data relating to amphibians and reptiles, to give you an idea of, of how we are in terms of reporting and, and, and recording reptile amphibian disease and mortality. So Frog Life um, is a charity focused on making practical differences for reptiles and amphibians through uh, developing new habitats, but also practical differences for people and communities engaging with uh, diverse communities, um, linking them with um, development uh, uh, of habitats and, and um, development of habitats for amphibians in particular. Um, we also work to inform global research on reptiles and amphibians. And we have three pillars of activity, transforming landscapes, transforming lives, and transforming research. And the transforming research uh, aspect of our strategic plan includes one of our strategic aims, which is to act as the public portal for amphibian and reptile disease and mortality reports. And we do that through engaging and working with the Garden Wildlife and Health Project. But our, um, our link with, with uh, ZSL goes right back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, when our co-founder, co founder, beg your pardon, um, Tom Langton was um, uh, working, setting up frog life and became very aware of a large number of rec rec records of, of frog mortality being reported in London, the southeast and the east of England. And he linked up with Andrew Cunningham at ZSL and set up a project called the Frog Mortality Project. And they identified the the cause of the mass frog mortalities as being due to Rana virus. And that was the first time Rana virus infection had been detected in Europe in wild amphibians. And the Frog Mortality Project continued through to 2013 when it um, formed up with BTO RSPB to create um, the Garden Wildlife Health Project, as we heard earlier. So I won't go through all of that slide. Um, but what we do um, try to do is get ZSL involved in, in um, providing information about the project to all of our staff. And so ZSL attend staff away day, staff meetings to stress the importance of submitting sightings to our project managers and our project teams. And they then work all across the country, um, uh, engaging uh, communities, talking to them about amphibians and reptiles. And... Um, and stressing the importance of, um, of sending these records in for us. And as you'll see, when we start to look at the data, the value of, of having a good data set. So what happens when somebody actually links onto our website to try and, and give us some information? Um, we start off, we have a, a, a screen on the website, which is linked to the Garden Wildlife Health Project. And effectively, they click on that, which takes them through to um, Garden Wildlife Health. And if they click on the box, the, the tab that says amphibians, what they find is this slide with a, a range of photographs, which are symptom identifiers, um, which uh, you can look at and you can try and link up with uh, diseases. And then there are a set of disease fact sheets, which provide information um, for the general public. And to give you an idea, if you click onto those disease fact sheets, this is what you end up with. Um, uh, an outline of the disease, what causes it, um, the symptoms. Um, and they're written in a way that's very informative. Uh, then they're, they're not heavy on the science side. They're, they're for um, citizen scientists and, and for concerned members of the public. And what this does give us is a really clear set of information that avoids the risk of false information and rumor, um, uh, which can become quite a, a hazard in terms of uh, the way people perceive um, these disease incidents or mortality incidents. And to give you an idea of the, the sort of reports that we get, we get stuff on social media, but we also get emails from concerned members of the public. And you can imagine that, that for, for many of, of the people contacting us, they're really upset and really quite distressed about these significant mortality events, dead frogs in the garden, dead frogs in their garden pond. Um, you know, these are animals which they, which they really care about and they nurture and they value. And um, it's one of the hardest things for our 
staff to respond to, I think, um, these types of reports, because often there isn't a, 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 a simple solution. Um, what you generally say is, well, the best thing is to remove the dead animals. And if there are animals that, that don't look well, leave them there in the hope that they will recover. Um, and a lot of people find that's not really what they want to hear. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is quite a challenge for us. And so we will generally, um, it, as in the case on, on the right hand side here, we'll generally find um, that we link up um, with Garden Wildlife Health, who, who can provide a bit more detail often than our staff can. <clears throat> and in some instances where the material is appropriate, um, uh, dead animals will be actually sent to ZSL for post-mortem. And then after post-mortem, a report goes back to the person who submitted that information uh, and kind of closes the loop so that, that they have a, an idea of what actually happened, what their animals died from. So you can see um, you know, the, the process that we go through in terms of uh, our link with the public uh, and ensuring that we give them as much information as we possibly can. So if you look at the data that we get at Frog Life, um, over the last, uh, the last seven years, we've had around about 3,000 inquiries by email, of which are approximately 300 were relating to reptile and amphibian mortality. So um, that equates to 10% of our inquiries, around about 45 to 50 a year. And most of those are linked to amphibians. And you can see this yellow block um, just here. Uh, that column relates to amphibians and the column uh, that you can only just see relates to, um, to our reptiles. And as, as Kata said at the beginning, um, reptiles are, are, are massively under-recorded because people quite often don't come across them even though they're there. And if you look at the symptoms that we get um, coming through reported to us, um, the majority of uh, our reports, our emails, link just to amphibian mortality or to a disease, um, an unassigned mortality or disease. Um, occasionally we'll get predation, we get some uh, reports of winter kill, and then in spawning season we often get reports of prolapse. Um, but uh, the majority of our records, 70 over 70%, 70 are just amphibian mortality. And the spread of those um, records through the year show a peak in, uh, in March, uh, linked to, to spawning. Um, and then again, um, we have a, a July, August, um, well, not a peak, but an, an increase in July and August. And this is often linked to a frog mortality events at the end of the summer. On a national level, if you look at the garden wildlife health data for amphibians and reptiles uh, in terms of annual reports, um, you can see starting in 2014, a gradual increase in uh, the number of reports. And we think this is, um, this is due to uh, the traction of the project rather than an in increase in incidence of disease. Um, and part of the reason for thinking that is if you look at 2020 and 2021 when we had lockdowns and people were far more aware of the, their environment, uh, their local environment and, and aware of what was going on around them, uh, we had an increase in records there um, those two years uh, in terms of the amphibian mortality and also reptiles. And if you look at the spread of the, um, the records over the four year periods two four-year periods and then the three-year period at, uh, at the end of the project, um, or most recent three-year period, I should say. Um, what we've got here is you can see the amphibians widespread across the UK, but for reptiles, we have a slight increase in the second half, in the second period, um, linked to, um, uh, again, we think uh, the increased attraction of the project as people become more aware of of the need to uh, be reporting this information. And what we can also do is look at the um, records by site and by the number of animals reported. So um, this uh, graph on the left-hand side with the green and blue bars, green is amphibians, blue is reptiles. This is the number of sites 
where disease or mortality events were reported. Uh, and you can see again in 2020, we have an increase, uh, presumably as more people were aware of what was going on in their environment. But in 2018, on the right hand side here, this is the number of animals reported. You can see a, a significant, significantly higher um, number of animals there than all the other years. Um, and that's, um, if you track back and look at the data, links almost entirely to frog mortality. Um, so this slide here, which you, you can't really see all the numbers on, but you can see the peaks. This is a slide that shows frog, toad and newt records over four breeding seasons. So we've got 2017, 2018, 2019 and 2020. Um, as you move from left to right across the uh, across the graph, and these blue columns are the frog incident reports, and you can see in 2018 these really high numbers of incidents that occurred in 2018. But in 2019, you have a spread across the whole of the year, which is quite different to the other years, and we don't know why that is. It's something that we're going to be looking at uh, in due course. But if you look at that 2018 year, you'd think, OK, it's clearly due to frogs. And uh, we can follow that up again by looking at a neuron multiple mortality instance. So this is frog or toad um, multiple mortality incidents reported. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite tricky this because the data comes from two different sources. And, um, and it's hard to identify what's meant by multiple mortality. Is that three animals? Is it? 100 animals, um, you know, so we have a, a slight issue with some of this data. But if you look at it, you can see again, in 2018, a high number of um, multiple mortality incidents reported. So you think, okay, so let's have a look at one of the, um, one of the, uh, the uh, diseases that impact frogs. And I've just pulled up Rana virus incidents uh, here. And if you look at Rana virus um, over the, uh, the period of the project from 2012 to 2022, you can see that actually there isn't a peak in 2018, which is um, you know, not what I expected. I expected to see a peak in 2018. Um, but it shows the, the importance of having this information because when you get these peaks of mortality, it's really valuable to be able to track back and try and work out what's actually going on. Is there a new disease appearing? Is there a disease that's appearing that's having a different impact on a different species? All of these, these things are relatively simple to track from the data, um, but we need the data. And that's why it's so valuable having the citizen science projects like this, where people are recording what they see across the whole of the UK for us. And as Kata said at the very beginning, um, we've got this new um, snake fungal uh, disease, which is uh, appearing in grass snakes. And we also have um, a, a, new, a new disease called Perkinsia, um, which is, uh, has a really significant impact on tadpoles in uh, North America and has been um, found in the UK um, in captive uh, amphibians. It, it's yet to be seen in the wild, as far as I'm aware, um, and uh, hopefully it won't be. But uh, was it to, were it to appear, um, we would want to be tracking it very, very quickly to be able to ensure we can manage it or at least um, control its impact if we possibly can. And that only comes from having the information that comes from our citizen science contributors. So thank you, everybody who does contribute. Um, please continue to report your sightings through to us uh, at Garden Wildlife Health or for amphibians and reptiles, you can use uh, info at froglife.org as well. Um, it's really important and really valuable, and we are uh, grateful for all the records you send in. So thank you very much. I'm happy to pick up on the questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was really interesting and shows again the variety of reports we receive in amphibians and actually the low number of reports that also you receive at Frog Life um, involving reptiles, yeah, but lots to learn. Okay, um, I would now like to invite all our speakers 
back into um, onto screen for our panel discussion. Um, thank you. We've got lots of interesting questions coming in through the Q and A um, options. And I've seen that many of them have already been answered um, and some of them we might pick up now and discuss. Um, lots of questions around garden bird feeding, best practice, and Will has shared lots of links to the RSPB guidelines and the guidelines um, on our website as well, um, which are sort of created with the contribution from RSPB and BTO and other organizations. So please have a look for all of these kind of information on our website. There's lots you can do um, actively to sort of reduce risks and to encourage birds um, to healthily stay in your garden. Um, one question we got in that I thought maybe anybody um, from the panel here could pick up and, and have a thought on is, um, so it says it's uh, GWH, so Garden Wildlife Health, um, Fantastic project that um, looks at trends of diseases. So thank you very much. Um, and are we seeing any cases of diseases that can be attributed to climate change? So I think Will touched it brief, briefly on this with avian influenza. Mike touched briefly on this with regards to suto potentially. And I think with ranavirus, also in amphibians, we might have issues there. So I thought maybe somebody wanted to have a brief comment on whether we already start seeing issues there or whether this is to be investigated. Should I come in on that? Please. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we, we haven't got conclusive proof, as in we haven't made the link directly, but I think climate change and a warming climate makes it more likely. So what we're seeing in our bird populations is we are seeing colonization by some species, we're seeing changes in migration patterns, there are a number of different things that we're seeing. And that's almost certainly the same for some of our invertebrate populations. We know from some work that we did through um, GBHI a number of years ago in, in the case of um, tit pox, where we were getting avian pox in, in great tits and blue tits, the work that we did there indicated quite clearly that that had emerged on the south coast and was almost certainly transmitted by biting insects that had come across the channel um, because the occurrence of tit pox was present in continental Europe at that time. So I think there's some good indications that, yeah, it's more likely. Um, and if you think about things like Usutu, where the vector is a, a mosquito, um, as conditions here change and become more suitable for mosquitoes, then we might expect to see uh, an increase in, in those cases. So, yeah, I think we've, we've got some circumstantial evidence that that is already happening. The actual direct link to climate change is harder to prove. Yeah. Do you see any changes in your reports that you might link to um, climate change, Andrew, from Probla? Uh, to be to be honest, we don't at the moment because the data that we have is is very very basic, um, and so what we're doing is we're looking at it on a on a sort of a block year by year basis, um, and um, it, it's not a a reliable set of data from that perspective. I think it, it's it's a it's it's still a blunt instrument for for the amphibians and reptiles. We don't have the detail that the the the, the uh, ornithologists have. Yeah, I think with um, the, there is a study that um, has shown that ranavirus, which is a, a viral infection that um, most commonly affects common frogs, but can also affect newts and, and common toads, that um, has a higher tendency to be transmitted and affect common frogs at higher temperatures. At higher temperatures, yeah. Yes, so there yeah. I think is a, there is a real risk here that we might see more cases with increased temperatures over time. That's something to keep an eye out. But what we don't we don't have any indication that that's actually happening i mean that's the that's the, so yes um you know that's why ranavirus tends to be at the end of the summer um yeah 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 um there is a but, question um for andrew specifically what was the name again of the new disease yeah, there's, a couple, there's a couple of questions about about that it's 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 perkinsia it, yeah. it, it's actually written like perkins c um but uh, it, it's not a virus. It, it, someone said about um, with the new virus, it's not a virus. It's, it's a single celled organism, isn't it? That, that it's is a, a parasite. Sort of parasitize, parasitizes yeah. the, 
the tadpoles, yeah. yeah. Similar uh, to trichomonas, it, just that it's on the skin rather than yeah, but it's yeah. a similar organism. So my, my understanding is that it hasn't appeared in the wild in the UK. It's been um, isolated in a captive um, European tree frog, I, if I remember rightly, um, uh, some, somewhere in the south of England. Um, it, was, it was isolated from, the, from, from that, the aquarium that animal was in. Um, and that's the only incident that we've got in the UK so far. But um, the risk is that... Um, without appropriate biosecurity, if, if that's something that a captive source um, has, then there could be a risk of that actually infecting, um, uh, you know, water courses or, or, or surviving in, in, in water bodies, and that could then have an impact. So, you know, it's something we've got to be very aware of and very, very careful about with biosecurity for everyone who's actually keeping captive amphibians. Yeah, I've also seen that there's somebody's concerned um, who had seen deaths in their tadpoles. Um, so first of all, please do report these to us if it's in the wild and if it's captive animals, there is um, Oxford University are um, doing a, an investigation on this disease. So there's um, tadpole doctor, which you can find online, and they um, also investigate samples from captive populations to screen for this um, pathogen for Kinsey. Um, many questions I see Will answered plenty of those already. And there's one question that um, asked about common signs of ill health reported in garden birds. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, also for inquiry units um, from the RSPB side, the most common thing we get reported are leg lesions and finches, I think. Um, something that is easily spotted, it looks like growth and spiky growths uh, on the legs, um, either on one foot, on toes, or on both legs. It looks like some futuristic boots. And those are caused either by a mite, an aminocoptus mite, or a, by a specific papilloma virus, and also sometimes um, by a combination of both. And this, like normally birds can cope quite well with it, but in severe cases that might, that might lead to entanglement, difficulties in balancing in flight, and they might get easily predated or be predisposed to other traumatic impact. Um, so I think that's the most common thing by far that we get reported as a disease, not as a mortality reason. Um, any other specific questions I could pick up? We're running short on time, so it's difficult to choose. <laughs> um, lots of questions again about habitat and sort of encouraging natural sources. So again, um, you find lots of resources on the websites of all the projects on how you can encourage wildlife naturally to, to come into your gardens. Do we consider rodenticides to be a particular risk for hedgehogs? Um, it's a good question. I would say um, we should consider them to be at risk because of their natural behavior, meaning they're roaming far and wide, they live in rural areas as well as in peri-domestic urban areas. Um, and they are omnivores, so the opportunistic feeders. So they would feed on anything from invertebrates like slugs and insects that might be impacted by feeding on, on carrion. They might feed on um, any like vegetables, roots, um, but also small mammals, small amphibians, or carcasses themselves. So they are from direct and like a direct and indirect risk risk of rodenticides, um, which is why we think it's important to look. Um, how affected they might be by this. Um, any comments on frog herpes virus, which causes dis distributing scale lesions in some populations, but as I understand has been around for some time, but doesn't cause significant die-offs. Um, so frog herpes virus is something that we do see occasionally, and I think um, Andrew will agree that they, we get that reported, especially during the breeding season, quite a lot, which causes like candle wax, blister-like lesions on the skin. Um, it normally doesn't affect them. It doesn't seem to have a, a big health impact on them, and it regresses over time. Um, so, but there has been uh, there have, have been reports of toad herpes viruses, which causes yeah. dark patches on toads. Um, from Switzerland, um, and we have a very, very small number of reports of similar sightings in the UK, but we have not had any samples, so 
Um, we don't know what is causing that or if it is present, but this is also something we're looking out for. Yeah. The other thing with 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 um, some of these uh, diseases that that don't lead to mortality is we what we don't really don't have an indication of is what the sublethal effect is on a lot of the animals um, and the amount of energy they have to put into actually fighting that disease, which then leads to um, you know higher mortality in the winter or potentially um, problems with metamorphosis if they're you know tadpoles. Um, those are the things that uh, that we never really get a handle on. Um, Will, did you want to come in on any of the many questions that you've responded um, in written busily um, that you thought would be worth sharing before we sort of... Just a quick quick comment on climate change. The um, I think yes, it's time yes. to talk about um, House Sparrow. So um, um, uh, um, I IOZ hosted a very interesting student with RSPB looking at the urban House Sparrow decline. And avian malaria was found to be occurring across colonies in London at very high prevalence, I think 75% prevalence or something, if I remember the details. Uh, and, and also survival and colony growth was negatively related to the intensity of the infection. So it's sort of raising the possibility that avian malaria might, might have been implicated in the decline of the London sparrow. And um, what we do know about avian malaria is it's spreading north across Europe. Um, so, you know, as the mosquito, the, 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 the vector um, spreads north and, and it's possible that, that populations in, in um, you know, more northerly parts of Europe are now becoming exposed to this pathogen, perhaps for the first time, and they might lack natural immunity. I mean, that is all hypothetical. But what we do know is the avian malaria is on the move north as a consequence of climate change. And that is going to pose that is an example of an infectious d disease, you know, posing new and new threats to 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 populations that that may lack the immunity that they need yeah a very good point um i think we're slightly over time already um if anybody has any final comments they want to make i think um otherwise I think it's, we have collaboratively shown the importance and the power of citizen science and um how important disease is um, and how it can impact population health as well as individual health and how we need to work together to investigate this further and learn how we can support our and safeguard our wildlife. Um, okay, so if there's no further comments, I would like to really, really thank Will, Mike and Andrew again for their great and fascinating contributions today and the thought provoking contributions that we had in this, uh, in this short Q&A session. Um, and thanks to everyone who attended and who got involved by submitting interesting questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, massive thanks also to Harriet, who was leading on organizing this event and ensured that all ran smoothly this evening and to my colleague, Sarah, who's also helping busily in the background with uh, questions. So the next science and conservation event will be in February, um, looking at the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown on human wildlife interactions. So this promises to be very interesting. So keep an eye on that um, on the What's On page on the SETSL website and uh, also for further updates on other upcoming events. And again, we would really appreciate if you could please let us know what you thought of tonight's event and any feedback um, you could provide um, through the survey, which Harriet will share in the chat. Um, we, there it is. I hope you can all see that. So if you could all please click that link and give us some feedback, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and yes, thank you all very much again for coming and hopefully see you at a future event really, really soon. Have a good evening.